I will. I will start talking very, very slowly, uh, so that, that gives you all a bit of time to find your seat. But we do need to uh, we do need to start this session because we are already uh, we are already uh, running out of time. So um, I would like to welcome all of you to this uh, session uh, entitled the budget to shape our future and in this session we will have two uh, panel uh, discussion and i will start with with introducing uh, the first uh, the first panel so the focus of the first panel will be on how the eu can best support uh, competitiveness and uh, growth. ...was to launch the investment plan uh, for Europe, better known as the Juncker plan. And the centerpiece of this Juncker plan was the, uh, the European Fund for Strategic Investments, or better known as EFSI. And, and as you all know, this, this fund has been recently re reinforced. Um, this instrument came on top of, of, of other, other instruments that, that were already there. Uh, Horizon uh, 2020, uh, Connecting Europe facility, and last but not least, uh, the structural uh, invest uh, structural and investment funds so so in fact we we do not start completely from from scratch now i'm very happy to to, to say that we uh, we are joined by an excellent panel of uh, four, uh, four highly esteemed persons and the discussion of today will be kicked off by mr Jack, Giacomo benedetto holder of the jean monnet chair in eu budget policy at the Royal Holloway University of London. Mr. Benedetto has published extensively on matters of EU policy, and more recently, his focus has turned to the study of package deals uh, in European uh, Union policy making. And I've, uh, I've asked uh, Mr. Benedetto to be as concise as possible and to try to limit his intervention uh, to no more than eight minutes, and, and much to my delight, he indicated to me, well, within five minutes, I should be, this should be uh, done. Um, so after the key uh, note speech of Mr. Benedetto, we will turn to the other members of the panel. And, uh, and uh, by now, I think we, we are complete. Uh, so Sorry. welcome. No, that's that, that's well. That happens. I, I know that stretched quite well, actually. So, so uh, yeah, uh, I know it happens. So, um, um, to my right, um, we have Mr. Uh, Takac, Minister of State for European Affairs, in the in the Prime Minister's office, if I understand correctly, of of Hungary. Hungary. Uh, then um, to my left, uh, Mr. Alberto Nadal Belda, State Secretary for the Budget and Expenditure in Spain. And then uh, the last arrival, uh, Mr. Karel Leuben, Rector of the Delft University of Technology in, uh, in the Netherlands. And I want to already thank you for all for, for taking the time to align with us with your, with your insights. Um, to, so to the other panel uh, members, I would also ask uh, to be as, as concise as possible, uh, trying to, to keep the intervention to five minutes. I've heard that this, this may be a bit, uh, was a bit different than, 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 than instructed, so, so I, I, uh, but uh, I still would ask you to, to do your best. Uh, because uh, whatever happens, we need to, we need to finish uh, a quarter uh, to 11, and uh, I would be very delighted if we would have some time for interaction with 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 the audience. So, so, uh, so with <coughs> this, um, I would like to invite Mr. Uh, Benedetto to take the floor and to deliver his his keynote uh, remarks. 
Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> thank you also for the, uh, for the invitation. I'm going to start by just saying something very briefly about how we should all understand added value as, as additionality. Uh, and why the European Union can offer this <clears throat> as something which is a bonus of, of EU membership before we get into questions of net balance. So what is added value? Well, added value offers a saving with transaction costs. Uh, there's the idea that uh, running an expenditure policy at the European level is cheaper than running 28 or 27 national expenditure policies. So there are savings in transaction costs. Those would be transaction costs for policies that could be run perhaps more expensively at the national level. The second feature of added value are cross-border benefits. Uh, and we see uh, notable policy uh, or, or, or funding uh, streams such as the Connecting, Connecting Europe program, um, where uh, across, across borders infrastructure is constructed in order to facilitate economic growth uh, and to build and further enhance the internal market. And finally, the, the third aspect of added value are, are those of threshold effects. These are investment policies which would be too expensive for any one member state to embark on a loan, but where collectively the, the, uh, the uh, organization of expenditure at the European level allows for the acquisition of some new objective which would be impossible at national level. And here I would give examples uh, such as ITER or uh, the satellite program. So these are the areas of really where added value offers something at the European level that you cannot have at the national level. In order to get there, we have a problem with um, the net balance approach. And I will be disagreeing uh, in the few minutes left with uh, my colleague Friedrich Heinemann. Um, I think it is possible to get away from rebates as we've understood them, particularly given the fact that the UK is leaving uh, the European Union. Um, part of the uh, uh, method for achieving an added value uh, budget policy for the EU uh, will be uh, reform of own resources, uh, if that is delivered, um, which would reduce the extent to which uh, the budget is financed directly from member states' GNI, wouldn't abolish it, it would reduce the GNI dependence, uh, and uh, where that money would come from instead of from GNI would be through forms of financing that have an added value effect of their own. And I'm thinking in particular of some of the possibilities. For example, um, uh, taxation in relation to climate change, uh, carbon taxation, or on transnational corporations, uh, which would uh, enhance uh, the internal market. Uh, and that could be part of uh, an added value feature of, of finance raising that contributes uh, or, or goes hand in hand with reforms to a budget that can expand investment in research and innovation for jobs and growth. Uh, in terms of net balances, uh, in some sense, the, 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 the analogy is flawed. For example, just to take the example of research and innovation, for certain, there will be countries whose research base is advanced and to which contracts are awarded. But uh, in the field of scientific research, if innovations are achieved, it's not only the university or the enterprise that receives the contract that is benefiting from money. It's not as if ITER is purely a transfer policy that sends money to France, where much of ITER's funds are... are are, are, are uh, located uh, in terms of in terms of the infrastructures. Um, we we have uh, a policy uh, in the fields of scientific research that will bring benefits to the whole of the EU, whether it's in the field of nuclear fusion or satellites or or, or, or whatever. And some of these benefits are not even economic if they are enhancing the well-being of citizens. It goes. Uh, for example, through the field of, of medical research, uh, we, we, we see benefits that are, go beyond the purely economic. So to think of these uh, areas of expenditure as if they're simple transfers is flawed. Um, but in embark 
then uh, b besides what it relies purely within the 1% GNI EU budget, we also have to evaluate the effect of these financial flows in funds outside of the EU budget, starting with FC, but there's also the ESM and many other uh, funds and instruments that lie outside of the formal EU budget. And if we compute them, they're well above 2%, even getting to 3% of GNI once we put in uh, the value of uh, the uh, ESM. Now, um, so in moving to this research and innovation budget, where I see a potential issue is with some, perhaps with cohesion countries whose research base uh, and innovation base is relatively low. Uh, and in order to embark on this reform, uh, we need to have a package deal that can really offer something to everybody, which is a collective gain for all. Um, and uh, for certain, um, a, a budget which uh, raises some of its financing from instruments like a uh, corporation uh, income tax would uh, be preferable in some respects f as a form of financing to those countries with whose economies are less developed than others. At the same time, the uh, cohesion policy can be much more focused on delivering sustainable economic growth well beyond the period of financing, for example, in fields such as ICT infrastructure, um, uh, CEF, um, uh, connecting peripheral regions and economies uh, with modern transportation systems and uh, energy networks, and in particular, energy security, which among some of the uh, cohesion countries, energy security is a major concern. So finally, what I'd say is that we have, particularly if we go in the direction of some forms of financing, um, uh, we have... Um, <coughs> Uh, we have uh, potential doubts from some member states uh, in, 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 with regard to um, uh, carbon taxation. Uh, and uh, there is a, a, a case for having a new rebate system not based on net balances, on net contributions, but on gross contributions. So if a particular form of financing for the budget somehow, uh, as a percentage of a country's GNI, seems to be abnormally high, as it would be in the case of carbon taxation for uh, a handful of member states, a form of, of rebate on the gross contribution rather than the net contribution could be considered. Uh, and then that will not discourage the uptake of EU funding uh, by such member states. And such a rebate could be in the form of investment precisely in areas of research and innovation as part of that wider package deal. So the problem, one of the problems with the British rebate is that it's, it's cash, essentially, without any conditions. Uh, any future rebate on gross contributions, we could consider uh, a, a system which, uh, which would not be uh, without conditions. The conditions would be uh, to use such funds to uh, part finance um, investment in research and innovation. Okay. Well, uh, thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Benedetto, uh, first for, for being indeed very, uh, very concise, uh, but also for, for some, some very interesting uh, ideas and, and, and concepts. Uh, I think uh, at least one thing that I, uh, I, I take from it, and I hope that I translate it in the, in the, in the right, right way, is that what you're saying, that, look, if there's really EU added value, then the issue of, of the just return should not uh, should not be there. Right? But then then the, there's no need for uh, rebates, uh, etc. So um, I um, I think you also mentioned a few points on on on, on uh, a possible uh, tension between objectives of cohesion countries and, and uh, of other uh, other countries so I think that that gives a good bridge uh, to uh, to the next uh, speaker so I would like to uh, invite uh, mr. Takak uh, for his uh, for his intervention thank you very much and a very good morning to to you all thanks for the invitation obviously and the first big challenge for us in the MFF discussion is to keep these time limitations 
Uh, but as once I learned in Africa, they said that we in Europe, we have the time and they in Africa, I mean, we in Europe, we have the watch and they in Africa, they have the time. Uh, but anyway, uh, thank you very much for the introduction, Mr. Benedetto, and try to reflect on that as well and, and talk about our view, how we can, or we should invest in Europe to enable Europe uh, for more jobs, uh, better growth, and more competitive Europe uh, after all. Uh, we all know that the, the 10 years uh, that we, are, uh, we have left behind uh, with this economic and financial crisis and a uh, set of other challenges, they resulted in, in major cutbacks in business, trade, government uh, spending, uh, and of course uh, resulted also in the loss of many jobs with young Europeans uh, disproportionately affected uh, by that. So the challenge is here. But I believe that due to coordinated efforts and as part of that uh, uh, major sacrifices by many member states, now we can say that Europe has returned to a path of uh, economic recovery and, and managed to, to reignite uh, its growth engine along with improving its unemployment uh, rates. Member states are now gaining uh, higher tax revenues, which provide an opportunity for a greater degree of redistribution and increased public spending. But of course, it's very important to keep the national budget under control, to keep the 3%. Uh, it's also a very important element, and that's certainly true for my country, uh, Hungary. At the same time, uh, while there are many uh, new developments that uh, provide some element of uh, optimism for all, for all of us, we can see that there are new challenges as well. And not only security, uh, migration, uh, defense budget, but another challenge uh, which is coming from uh, technologic uh, or technological development, info, communication, digital sector, the fourth industrial revolution are just some examples. Well, I believe the European Union has some disadvantage compared to other regions uh, of the world, rather uh, nations in the, in the world, uh, and it uh, profoundly affects our competitiveness, obviously. So the EU is lagging behind uh, in the global competition, and therefore I believe we need to be aware of it, first of all, and intensely follow the global economic trends and react to the new information-driven economic uh, revolutions. Innovation and digitalization, I believe, uh, should be, or maybe must be, seen as a, a priority. Um, information and communication technology has contributed largely to the value added and productivity of our manufacturing sector. Due to the digital transformation, products tend to be transformed into services. Uh, and this influences the traditional approach uh, towards industrial policy. In these areas, it's important to take into account the need to develop programs that can be effectively applied also to more and to less uh, wealthy member states. Now, for a complete digital transformation, uh, successful development is needed in key technological areas, such as automation, communication, speed of data processing, and uh, software development methods. At the same time, the digital transformation is not only about technology, but as importantly about the way technology is used in combination with several other changes in the industry, but also in legislation and as importantly in society. We must uh, very thoroughly consider the impact of digitalization, the changes in labor market on our, uh, our societies, how they will react. Uh, and also we must pick up on key forward-looking trends including artificial intelligence, autonomous systems, 5G, startups, standardization and IT uh, security. Uh, in this regard, support for competitiveness should, be, should continue to be a strategic goal uh, for the European Union, uh, and this must be attributed to the less developed uh, the regions and member states uh, as well, as we believe that only a more economically coherent union can provide uh, more effective responses to the handling of financial and economic challenges and possible shocks as well. Uh, of course, uh, from our perspective, cohesion policy is uh, one of the most visible policies of the European Union, 
and I was very pleased to learn about the uh, more scientific uh, identification of what is an added value. Uh, provides savings with, uh, with, with uh, uh, costs, and, and, but also it's a cross-cutting character it has. And I believe that the cohesion policy has already proven its efficiency. It created millions of jobs all over the European Union. Um, it has brought benefits to millions of people by investing in uh, infrastructure modernization, but also environmental developments, support to business, and in people's skills, education and training. So I agree that the, maybe while the treaty-based uh, goals of the cohesion policy remains unchanged, and I, be I believe there is no disagreement among member states on that, uh, converging, convergence, the, converging the less developed uh, regions. But of course we have to revisit how we can uh, more efficiently reach that, what to invest in it. But uh, before we agree on the size of the budget and spending, I think we first of all have to be aware of our ambitions. Uh, we have to know what we need to tackle. Of course, security is a challenge that we have to tackle with financing, but at the same time competitiveness. And we should look at which are the policies that can uh, best uh, support that. And if at the end of the day, we come to the conclusion that this is cohesion policy, then we should not kill it. Uh, maybe we should have to reshape it a bit, but it doesn't mean that this is not an efficient and, and good policy. So all in all, uh, that's the, the, uh, the major message uh, from our government. And while, of course, uh, there are new uh, instruments, uh, uh, FC and others, we also have to see how it is applicable in member states, because it, it is not uh, applicable with the same efficiency in all the member states. So also, we have to be very realistic and uh, responsible uh, in that way. But we have a huge uh, uh, responsibility uh, working towards a converging, competitive and digital Europe, which will secure the everyday needs and uh, good standards for the upcoming generations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this for this intervention, and uh, and I think if if I listen to you carefully, I, I, I well I hear a couple of things. Uh, one, clearly, you say look, cohesion policy is is very important. One one can uh, look at, at ways to 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 modify it and make it even more uh, beneficial. Uh, but but uh, uh, don't, don't just kill it uh, before you know what you put back in in place. Huh? That 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 that's one uh, one thing that I take very clearly from from your uh, intervention. The other one, and uh, and that is an interesting uh, perspective. Also, is is uh, as you also very clearly underline uh, the importance of the digitalization uh, of uh, innovation, uh, making and making funds av available for that purpose. So that that's the the, the, the two things that I I take uh, well I take more from it, but but. Uh, so the, oh, thank you very much uh, for that. Um, now, uh, on technology, uh, I think uh, the, the, the next uh, speaker could, could certainly say uh, a word or two. Uh, Mr. Karl Leuben, as I mentioned, he's the rector, uh, rector of the Delft University of Technology uh, in the Netherlands. And uh, please, uh, I would be grateful if you could take the floor. Thank you very much, and thank you for the kind invitation uh, to speak here uh, today. Uh, it will not uh, be a surprise which angle I come from, being uh, at the Delft University of Technology and also being the president of a network of 54 universities in Europe, which is called CESAR. Uh, I would plead for, uh, of course, education and research and innovation, uh, because I think they are at the roots of the growth and development in the longer term. The question, if you uh, want to address growth and jobs, is at what period in time do you want to have results from your investments? And uh, if you invest in a company and it's successful, then you get your return very quickly. But if you invest in education, you'll have to wait because you start with primary education, secondary education, tertiary education, and that will take a long time, but it will be, be much more and much longer lasting. I will give you a few examples of how universities can contribute to these type of uh, developments, and I will come back to what I call this time constants, characteristic time of investments, uh, 
at the end of my uh, presentation. Regional development uh, and regional policy could be conducted and executed smarter, I think, than it is done at the moment. If we would involve the universities in this, uh, in a regional setting more than we do uh, presently, let me give you an example. In the setting in South Holland, where the university is based, we have linked up with the Leiden University and the Erasmus University, pushed the governments of the cities and the companies in the region to form a regional development uh, 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 setting uh, uh, organization called a ROM or IQ, Innovation Quarter. Uh, and this helps considerably already in a shorter term to uh, increase growth and to get more jobs in, in the region. Uh, this. Uh, of course, requires that local and regional leadership of government between universities is uh, adequate. And how do you govern and run a European region successfully is a question. How to overcome polarization, how to overcome social divides, how to generate positive ambitions, integrity and goodwill. Well, I would refer you to the allegory of good governance uh, that can inspire future leaders. Look at Wikipedia, the allegory of good and bad government. It's a worthwhile story to read. It's fun and it's inspirational. <coughs> Universities can play, I think, a better role in these regional developments by providing them with better access to the existing tools like the EIT and like the kicks in the EIT. They have demonstrated that co-location structures are able to foster growth uh, and to help jobs in uh, various geographical areas in Europe linked uh, to each other. But also projects between universities in particular regions themselves, like the leading fellowship program where we have a number of postdocs between the three universities I just mentioned, is an example of that. And with that, we could stimulate local field lab type of developments to bring what universities are doing closer to what the world is needing. I come back to what universities are doing and what the world is needing in a, a few minutes. The, uh, R and I, or research and innovation uh, development, was already mentioned by the previous two speakers. So I'm very pleased to see that we are very much in line here. Uh, Mr. Benedetto said that uh, we should, let's say, increase the uh, effort in uh, R and I. Uh, at the moment, 13% uh, of the budget goes into this domain of uh, growth. Uh, and, and jobs, and half of that roughly uh, goes into R&I, research and innovation. Uh, uh, well, I don't have to tell you how much goes in agriculture to, to see the difference between the, the two domains. Uh, and also my uh, right neighbor, Mr. Takas, uh, uh, pleaded for investments in the new technologies and the new developments, and I think they are crucial. Uh, so uh, a stronger uh, program in this domain would help the longer term. And how would you link it again to the development of, of states, regions, nations? In my uh, thinking, I very much agree with what Oettinger said in his report on EU finances. The, the sustainable development goals of the United Nations form a, a perfect umbrella and a perfect uh, a tool to hang on the developments uh, we are doing in the domain of research, education and innovation. Um, a sharper way of defining the revenues of what we do in those domains compared to what comes out of it is needed. We tend to look at too short time frames. We tend to look at uh, what results do investments bring in the short run. At least in our country, if we look at uh, how the uh, programs by the uh, different uh, political uh, parties are evaluated at the beginning of a new government or in the middle of a new government, they do evaluations of those investments that lead to return on investment within the frame of governance of that particular government. Well, of course, if you put money into research, you will definitely lose money in a frame of two years' time. It's not going to bring anything. So if you take that time frame, what I call the time constant, too short, it doesn't work. Now, the benefit of investing in research and innovation in the domain of universities is that at the same time you educate people. Education is the best way, I said in the beginning, to uh, in the long run see to it that there is economic growth. And by combining research and education, educating uh, master students, educating PhD students, we see to it that we get a long-term return. Thank you very much. Uh, th thank, thank you very much. And indeed, as you, you, re uh, you remark, uh, there are, are striking, striking similarities in, 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 in the positions uh, taken, uh, taken so far. I think everybody underlines uh, so far the importance of R&E, uh, uh, investing in, in, 
in innovative uh, technologies. Uh, I think what what is uh, what is interesting, uh, at, at least what I, I take also from you is, is your point on on uh, yeah, being patient enough in a, in a way uh, and, uh, and 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 uh, take the, take the long uh, the long view, which which indeed is is I think in particular in in in, in the field of innovation technology. Uh, a very important one. Uh, another one, uh, and, and certainly not surprising from from your perspective, but but I think it's it's certainly something to to reflect very carefully uh, on. Is uh, you, you point to to network effects in in in, uh, in, in uh, and that universities can can play actually a very important role in uh, in that and and helping in that way to make also. The existing instruments uh, smarter, as you, as you say. It. So, so I think this is certainly something to 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 reflect on. Uh, so, so thank you, thank you very much um, for that. With that, I I, uh, I turn to the next uh, speaker, Mr. Alberto Nadal Bella, as I said, State Secretary for the Budget and Expenditure in Spain, and the floor is yours. And I think we still have a bit of time. So, so um, yeah. thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, good morning. Thank you for the invitation to this panel. Uh, we are discussing today, which is probably the most important topic on what can the European Union do for its citizens, growth, investment, and employment. And let me start by saying that we all know that we live in a world of radical changes. We are just beginning to see the consequences of the digitalization of the economy. We can store and manage information in ways that was unforeseen just a few years ago. We have instant uh, information from anywhere in the world. We have instant contact through many uh, technological ways that is changing completely human relations and politics. And that has created a lot of changes, opportunities, and fears uh, among our population. So the question is, how can we build a European budget that can face these challenges, are able to keep growth and employment creation inside the Union, and at the same time help us, every one of us, to adapt to the new circumstances? And I think the answer to that, at least the answer from an economist from the finance minister, you know that finance ministers usually try to work with reality, um, is two things. <laughs> the first thing is, especially when you work on the budget area, um, two things. The first thing is proactivity. Competitiveness, we can call it. And it's very close related to market size. Uh, probably one of the most important achievements of the European Union has been the internal market. The internal market means economies of scale, risk pooling, market sharing. Ma internal market has been built primarily through the uh, regulations, through common regulations, but the budget has a very important role to play. Why? Because to build an internal market, the first thing we need is European infrastructures. And there, in the connection, in the Connected Euro facility and in the cohesion funds, we have a lot to build infrastructures to create and reinforce the internal market. In the new world we are beginning to live, it's not only classical infrastructure that are still important. Transport facilities, highways, high-speed trains, all that's important. But it's even today more important, the new infrastructures we have to build. And we have to build them at European level. One of my predecessors spoke about ICT. It's critical for the survival of the uh, European economy in the new world, but also energy infrastructures. If, want, if we want to fight efficiently against climate change, we have to reduce the cost of energy production. And to do so, we have to pull the risk of having different technologies in different parts of the continent at the same time. If we increase the amount of renewable energy in Europe, we know that at some point of the continent will be blowing wind, and in other parts of the continent will be 
the, the sun will be shining. And we have to share the different sources in order to have uh, efficiently done the fight against the uh, climate change. The second thing we need is adaptability, flexibility. And that also means two different things. First, human capital, human capital should be adapted to the new needs of the world economy. If, one, if we want to keep good jobs in Europe, well-paid jobs in Europe, high quality jobs in Europe, our population has not only has to be better educated, but able to adapt easily to the new changes that are uh, taking place. Usually it's more important nowadays to be able to adapt the human capital than to acquire human capital that may be absolutely obsolete just a few years uh, after. Here, again, if we compare our education system with uh, other parts of the world that are more productive than ours, we see that we need a European university system, has been mentioned before. We need more interchange of uh, students and people inside the union. We have programs to do that. We have Erasmus, has been a success, but we should increase that. Our education system has to be more homogeneous, so also to help to move European citizens around the union. What else do we need? Research and development has been mentioned before. Why? Because you need size in order to pull the risk necessary to be successful in this area. Even the largest European countries are not enough compared to other economic areas in the world. So the only solution is to put in common our investigation and our research and development programs. A small and medium-sized enterprises. In Europe, as anywhere else, most of our companies are relatively small. Again, if the market, if the internal market is open and they are able to adapt their activity at a continental level, they will have much more capacity to compete at a global level. No company was ever created to be a multinational from the beginning. It started in a local market, then in a near market, and then in a bigger market in order to compete, to compete globally. And this is one of the main functions of the European Union for our small companies that should aspire to grow and be able to adapt and uh, compete in the global uh, economy. Border control and defense. This has also to, has a lot of to do with growth, investment, uh, and employment creation. Why? Because we all are aware that we are facing challenges in the areas of defense and security that we were not facing just a few years ago. And without a security area where everyone feels comfortable, it's impossible to grow invest and profit from the advantages of the internal market. And of course, there is European added value in these areas. Again, we cannot build an efficient European defense by, by individual member states. We need the collective action of, the, of all European uh, countries. Border control is the same thing. Whenever Spain, my country, <laughs> patrols the Mediterranean in order to stop illegal uh, traffic of immigrants is not only helping our citizens, it's also helping the rest of the Union. And the same case can be said by anyone that is trying to control borders in the whole perimeter of the European Union. Cohesion. I'm going very fast because I have only five minutes. Doing fine. <laughs> <laughs> Cohesion. Cohesion is the flip side of the internal market. Whenever we deregulate markets, whenever we integrate markets, they are winners and losers. 
It's impossible to avoid that. In the globalization process, there are winners and losers. Even if the whole economy and the whole area is winning from the benefits of creating the internal market and integrating it into the global uh, world, the, the global economy, not everyone is going to benefit in the same way. So I think we shouldn't look at the cohesion policy as a policy, as a transfer between member states, but a transfer for the winners, from the winners of the glo globalization process in a region, in a country, or in the, uh, uh, or in the whole uh, uh, European Union, and the losers. Because it's not worthy to create an area of prosperity and productivity if not everyone, at least partially, benefits from the fruits of this autonomous. Agriculture. Uh, listening to um, the session we had before and, li and listening to, to the other panelists, well, I, um, it's like agriculture has the fault of everything in Europe, <laughs> and that's why we don't have money for, everything, for anything else. <laughs> but if you look at that uh, uh, common uh, agricultural policy carefully, I don't think that it is not anymore just a policy to help farmers or to foster uh, some kind of uh, economic activity. It has a lot to do with climate change, the population, and integration of the territory. The cost for Europe of large areas of the populated, uh, of large area of, uh, of largely populated areas where nobody lives, where you have to support the territory in some way, where the environment is threatened, would be huge. And the weight of agriculture in the European budget is big because it's a European policy. It's not a national one. But compared to the whole amount of the European economy, what we devote to keep our farmers working and living in areas that otherwise would disappear is relatively small. And that's what we wanted to say. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this uh, this intervention. Um, now, the, the, you you mentioned a lot of things, so I, I will not try to to to, uh, to 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 summarize that in in any way. I think an interesting perspective, uh, a point that you made, uh, is, is 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 the one the link between the internal markets, uh, internal market uh, and, and investments that logically uh, come to that, uh, not only in the traditional uh, infrastructure, uh, but also in, in more newer infrastructure. And you mentioned the energy, uh, you mentioned the, the ICT infrastructure. Another interesting perspective, uh, and, and I really have to chew on it because I'm not sure I agree, but I find it interesting uh, nevertheless is, is uh, what you said about the, the cohesion policy that this is, uh, should be seen as, as, as compensation for, uh, for losers from, from, from the, uh, let's say, from, from globalization. And, and, uh, um, it's, 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 again, as I said, I, I would need to chew on it a bit, but, but, uh, but thank you for this thought uh, in any case, uh, because it's, uh, it's, it's certainly uh, an interesting one. Now, a final comment on, on, on my side, uh, a bit, bit light one, uh, having uh, been a finance official for myself for, for, uh, for the best part of my career, but in the Dutch finance ministry, uh, we would always ask, well, if, if you say, well, you want more on all these areas, okay, where do you want less? Is there anything you would like to, <laughs> would like to cut back in, uh, in, 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 the EU, in the EU budget? But maybe that's the peculiarity of the Dutch system, probably it is. But <laughs> anyway, uh, with that, uh, I, I would like to, uh, I would like to, to, to open, uh, open the floor. Um, and, and, and see whether uh, from, from the audience there are questions or, or comments, uh, reactions to, to what has been uh, said uh, by, by, the, by the panel.
Yes. Hi, uh, Jorge. I'm a journalist, Jorge Valero from Euractiv. Um, my question is that, um, I mean, I think we will all agree that if we had this conference seven years ago, we will be discussing the same things. I mean, the importance of research, education, um, sharing more resources, so on and so forth. The difference is that now, I mean, we see all this tech revolution and how Europe is lagging behind. The five major companies in the stock market and from the US uh, tech companies. So fast forward, in seven years' time, uh, we will be discussing again the same things, but maybe the consequences will be more concerning for, for Europe. So my question is whether maybe it's not only an issue of money, because you have Horizon 2020 with a lot of money, but it's also an issue of competencies, same most competencies, or do we have to accept that maybe because of Europe itself is so complex, with all the bureaucracy, different layers of administration, we have to accept that we are not that agile to adapt to the uh, let's say, uh, the changes of, of the world today. Thank you. Uh, yes, that's, uh, that's a good question. Well, uh, the questioner is, is correct. Uh, uh, more than a decade ago, there was the Lisbon process uh, with, with uh, an ambition to create uh, the world's most dynamic economy in Europe by a certain date, which has already passed us. Uh, and that was superseded um, in around 2009 by the Europe 2020 programme. Uh, so, of course, these discussions we've had before, but they've, they, they've, they've evolved. Um, and the uh, multiple crises that the European Union has faced, starting with the crisis of the Eurozone, but then more recently the migration crisis, are, are a focal point. They're a trig, they're a, they offer a potential for a huge change. And, you know, Brexit is also uh, one of these challenges. Uh, and an opportunity in terms of uh, what the budget could change and, and indeed become more agile. So indeed, the... The, the, uh, we have a budget which is tied up in legal regulation. I'm not saying that that's a bad thing, but we have a financial regulation, we have an MFF regulation, we have own resources uh, decisions, um, and uh, then regulations for each of the areas of expenditure. We need to have agreement on all of these to move forward. But the ambition uh, since the end of the 2013, when the... Uh, current MFF was agreed and the high-level group on own resources was appointed was to try to create a space to imagine a more agile budget. Uh, and uh, you know, One of the problems, uh, even in 2013, is that we couldn't have foreseen uh, the migration crisis and, uh, and, and other crises that developed in, in the meantime. With, and there wasn't a, a framework for a quick response to those. So that, 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 is, that is key, a much more flexible budget that can actually react with agility to challenges that are unforeseen at the time that an MFF is agreed. Okay. Yes, please. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, I believe also that the, the question was very correct and relevant. Obviously, uh, in 2013, when we had the last uh, or the latest MFF uh, discussion and debate, the same question was... Uh, was put up, uh, and it's relevant whether we will be talking about the same issues in, in seven years. And I believe that, uh, first of all, this current uh, period, 2014-2020, uh, was about a very modest budget, and we all know the reasons, because it had to reflect uh, on the state of play of the European Union in the midst of an economic crisis. So we could not be very ambitious. Uh, but I believe that now the situation has somewhat changed and we have to be more offensive, more ambitious, more agile, whichever word uh, you like for that, uh, because we have the opportunity. And the, the size of the budget uh, must match our ambitions. And I, I'm afraid that uh, we don't have uh, too many options to be ambitious, uh, because digitalization is happening, uh, not only in Europe, but all over the world. And if uh, the current trends continue, in Europe, then we will be lagging even more behind. 
And uh, on top of that, it's, it's happening at a pace which is unprecedented. While I obviously agree with my Spanish colleague about the importance of the spending on the defensive, so to say, the defensive side, uh, security, migration, and obviously my country is very much affected on border protection, so I agree with you, what you said. But at the same time, we, we cannot uh, only focus on that. Uh, competitiveness, uh, a self-confident, vibrant Europe is needed. And for that, we need to plan the budget very well. In Hungary, we have a saying that whenever we ask money from the finance minister, the finance minister can say only two things. I don't have money, or I don't give you money. Uh, one thing he cannot say that I have run out of money, because it means that he, well, he was not uh, planning it well. And this is his fault. Uh, by the way, we don't have a finance minister in Hungary. <laughs> we have an economic minister, and the finance uh, and the budget is run by a state secretary. This is also a way of innovation, by the way. Uh, so we have to plan well, uh, reflect on the, on the trends, and, uh, and that's it. And maybe then in, in seven years uh, we will be able to uh, assess and evaluate whether we have been good enough in this. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Belder. Well, well, we have to take into account that the European budget is relatively small compared to the size of the European uh, expenditure, public expenditure. So, it's not European money, in most cases, is just a catalysator for the national expenditure in order to help member states to allocate resources in what is important. That's why we, every seven years, we always discuss the same issues, adapting more or less to the new circumstances that, uh, that, that we are having, and it should be so because the world is changing more or less in the same direction for the last two or three decades. So we will be having this, the same discussion in seven years, of course. And we will have to adapt and put weight in different areas of this catalysator of the, um, of the European public expenditure that is the, uh, the, the, the European budget. Capacity to react. Well, this is Europe. We are 27 countries. Um, it takes time to, arrive, to reach consensus. We have problems to react in member states to circumstances that are unforeseen in Europe even more. But once we reach some kind of agreement of direction, it works. So I think Europe is much better with a European Union and a European butter, a budget than without it. Uh, I'm going to make a very bold statement. Uh, the previous speaker said uh, that the budget of Europe is relatively small. That's true. It's about 1%, I understand. Uh, and uh, that's a catalyst. That's also true. I happen to be a chemical engineer, and I know how catalysts work. So if you double the catalyst, that would definitely help. So if we would all double the budget, <laughs> simply double the budget, it would still be only 2%. And we would keep the expenditure for agriculture constant because we are all well fed. Then we have a lot of opportunity to talk about other things seven years from now. Okay. Uh, thank, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, I think we still have time for for uh, maybe one, maximum uh, two, uh, two questions. So, so is there um, any? Yes, please. My, my name is Adrian Schout. Uh, I'm from uh, Klingenaal, the Netherlands, and I'm. I don't know why they put the Estonian flag in front of me. Uh, I, I, I have a question. I, I could pose it for the EU budget in general, but uh, maybe to make it concrete um, and pragmatic uh, to universities. Um, why exactly do we need more money for European universities or European universities? Uh, is that because the, the national universities don't get together? Is it an inefficiency problem uh, between universities? Uh, or is there really a need why we need more European money for, for this? What is precisely the, the reason uh, for, for this? Uh, this could apply to all the uh, uh, headings, uh, but let's apply it to the universities. And related to this, as a, as, a, as a principal question, if more money goes to, let's say, universities at the EU level, does that mean that member states are going to pay less to universities, or is it 
simply uh, more. Uh, and, but that also applies to all the other headings in, in the budget. So uh, two questions in one. Yeah, I think the answer is very simple. If you, sorry. The answer is very simple. If you look uh, at, let's say, 70 years ago, about, and I'm quoting Dutch numbers now, about 10% uh, of, uh, of our population got a higher education. At the moment, we are moving towards more than 50 towards 70%. There's no reason, and, and studies show this clearly, that not 80% of the population could be having a university type of education. There's enough room in these brains as long as these kids are brought up properly. And most of the kids are brought up properly nowadays with the peace and quiet we have in Europe. Thus, we're not doing the same thing as we were doing many years ago, while the budget, in at least our case, stays the same. We have a 70% increase of number of students and no budget increase at all. So what are you doing if you spend university money, you are educating people, and you are therefore helping the world for the future? You have to look at the long-term impact of that. So it's simple. If the, if the budget stays the same, and it has stayed the same the last 15 years in our case, while well, the numbers have doubled in that same period almost, yeah, uh, it's simple. We go down. So oh, it's not only in the Netherlands. It's, it's a general problem I see in, uh, in Europe. And the uh, amount of uh, the number of people that can be well educated has to grow everywhere, not only in the Netherlands. But that is a multiple national problem. It's not a European problem. It's a problem of the member states. Uh, you could say so, but you could also treat it as a European problem. You could make a university system in Europe, like was suggested from Spain. You could make a doctoral type of education overall in Europe. Now it's all different, and there's a lot of money going into that differences, and there's a lot of immobility as a result of that. So yes, you could pay it from the national governments, but I just suggested to double the budget to Europe, and then you could pay it from Europe. Mr. Benedetto. <clears throat> well, a, a decision was taken many years ago to finance agriculture at the European level because of, of uh, a transaction um, uh, benefits from, from saving transaction costs, it being cheaper to have a single European policy. The same sort of rationale can be, can be, can be used when it comes to investment in research. The fact is that the vast bulk of uh, monies that flow to universities uh, whether it's for education or for research, uh, are national monies, either directly paid by students or by governments. So the amounts of, 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 of uh, funds that we're talking about at the European level are very small, even at the level of Horizon 2020. Um, universities have a cross-border effect, um, and, it's, and, and with uh, international sort of knowledge networks, there is an intrinsic logic to having um, transnational financing for uh, cooperative uh, research uh, and innovation projects. Um, uh, and, and, you know, I really, I'd really leave it at that. We, we have uh, education uh, as, as a policy area remains fundamentally national in terms of uh, regulation and finance, and that's not going to change. So we do have national policies, and there can be a, a, an efficiency um, advantage to move for a greater Europeanization, undoubtedly. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Uh, yeah, briefly, uh, uh, just a reflection on that. But as uh, previous speakers spoke about agriculture and the spending of agriculture, I, I believe we have to defend that a bit as well. After all, we, we have to eat, and well, we, we have to we, we have to eat uh, good food, uh, secure food, good quality, same standards everywhere, and uh, it's important. Uh, I think agriculture is important because. We should not be taking away a uh, disproportion of money from agriculture, but you know, not contradicting with what I've said before and relating to education. Of course, it's, it's important. And as a matter of fact, uh, in this debate, whether it's a national problem or a European problem, mm -hmm. after the European Union is a union of member states, and uh, the member states have their problems, which adopt to be a European problem after all. But uh, I agree with my colleague uh, from Delft uh, that uh, uh, this is quite a general problem in, uh, in Europe. Uh, efficiency or inefficiency in, in, in education. With, with some of the colleagues, we just discussed that cohesion policy is one policy there where we are always making impact assessment reports and efficiency assessment reports. We are not making it for other policies, so we don't know. I, or at least not to that much standard as in, in case of cohesion policy. So we have to see 
how efficient education is. It is good that we increase the number of students to 70%, but it's also very relevant what we teach them and what uh, knowledge we give them. Will it be a relevant knowledge, a knowledge that can be used uh, in the technological era? Uh, I've read some reports that in my country, in Hungary, all those who are currently employed, uh, as we speak, 65% of them, uh, of currently employed people in Hungary, will have to do something else in their life in the future because of technological development. And if they don't have the skill for that, to change, to be flexible, to be adaptive, then I think we have not invested well in education. And of course, uh, programs like Erasmus Plus, I agree with what the commissioner said yesterday, we must keep them. They're very important programs and they have proven their uh, added value and their uh, uh, efficiency. So let's invest in education, but let's invest uh, in education in a smart uh, way. A smart budget uh, is needed for that. Okay. Sorry. Uh, uh, one number, one number. Okay. Sorry, from the influx of our faculty members, more than 50% is not Dutch, and most of them come from Europe. That's a good reason to finance it from Europe. We, we're going to, uh, to stop the, this discussion uh, here. I, I, uh, we have uh, exhausted uh, our time. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry about that. Uh, but I, as I said, we, we, we have to stop at uh, a quarter to 11 now. We, we have passed it. We will have a, a short break where we will be back at 11. Uh, at 11. And I want to thank uh, warmly our, our panel uh, members. And I think a big hand is, uh, is in order. I'll just give you, give you a reflection.
Okay, Lady, ladies and, uh, and gentlemen, um, again, uh, I, I will follow a bit the same procedure, um, starting to talk a bit, bit slowly in the hope that, that people will, will find uh, their place, uh, people outside will realize that the session is, uh, is starting uh, again. Um, we, we had, a, I think, a very, very interesting uh, first um, uh, panel, uh, panel discussion. Um, now, we, we now turn to a topic uh, that I can say is even closer to my at least professional heart than, uh, than the previous one, and that is uh, the topic of, uh, of, of structural reforms. Um, I believe personally, that there is a, a growing awareness uh, that for the EU to function well, we need strong and well-functioning uh, member states. Uh, because no matter how you look at it, uh, a very, very large part of what is uh, EU policies are actually implemented uh, on, on, the national, uh, on the national level. And if, if national member states do not function well, the EU as a whole doesn't function uh, well. Now, with this, this recognition, uh, the uh, structural reforms, and uh, I would include in that administrative uh, modernization at the level of uh, member state has moved uh, center stage, and this is also reflected in, uh, in new instruments that have been uh, proposed and accepted, uh, proposed by the Commission and accepted by the core legislators. So in, in last year, uh, in 2017, uh, the so-called Structural Reform Support Programme uh, came into existence. And under this program, uh, member states can apply for technical support for the design and implementation of st uh, structural and administrative reforms. And this support is purely on, on demand, and, and it hap happens to be delivered by the service that I'm, uh, I'm, I'm leading, so that's why I'm, I'm advertising it here uh, a little bit. Um, now, due to the very high demand of the, for this service, the Commission has proposed to substantially increase the budget for the SRSP already under the current MFF, and this will also allow to provide more support to, to those uh, member states that, uh, that do not uh, have the euro yet, but that uh, want to adopt the euro. Now. Um, this is already for, under the current MFF. For the next MFF, the question is very much on the table whether uh, the existing instruments to uh, promote uh, structural reforms, uh, whether they are enough or whether more can be done or should be done to encourage member states to pursue uh, important structural and uh, administrative reforms. And, uh, and this is uh, the topic, I think, of, of, uh, of, of this panel. And again, uh, we have a very highly qualified panel. Uh, the keynote statement uh, will be given by Mr. Vabian uh, Zulich. Uh, I hope I pronounced that well, or at least not too poorly. Um, Mr. Zulich is the chief executive and chief economist of the European Policy Center. Uh, he has worked on a wide range of topics, including on economic governance of the Eurozone, digital single market, Euro European labour market and the EU budget and many, many, many more uh, topics. Um, now, after the introductory remarks, um, uh, we will turn to the other uh, panel members. Uh, now, to my right, uh, I have Mr. Edward Skilkluna, Minister of Finance from Malta, and again, apologies <laughs> if I pronounce names in the wrong way. Uh, then, uh, Mr. we have uh, Mr. Eliodor Mandres, uh, State Secretary for Public Finance, uh, Romania and uh, then we have Mr. Rist uh, uh, Ah, over there, yes, 
Mr. Risto Achoki, Secretary of State for Finance in, uh, in, in Finland. And then we will be joined uh, also by uh, Mrs. Perfens uh, Beres, uh, Member of European Parliament and, uh, and also um, a Member of the Committee on Economic and Monetary Affairs, and Mr. Marcus Ferber. And I, I don't know whether they have they arrived yet. Um, and Mr. Marcus Ferber, um, Vice Chair of the Committee on Economic and Monetary Affairs. So uh, I, I hope they will, will, will join us uh, soon. Um, I, as, as in the first panel, I, I need to insist on, <coughs> on conciseness and brevity. Uh, because we, we really need to end this, this panel at 12.15, uh, uh, because 12.30, uh, Commissioner Oettinger is, is, is coming, uh, coming back. And, and so that, that makes it for a natural end of this, uh, this meeting. Um, so um, I would ask, uh, well, to, 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 for you to stay hopefully below the 10 minutes that you, you have prepared. Eight, eight would be better, but if it's 10, it's, it's 10. But also to the other members uh, of the panel to, to try to be as concise uh, as, as possible. And with this, uh, I turn uh, the floor to Mr. Sidi. Uh, um, thank you very much, and thank you for the invitation. I will try to be brief, so I will skip over some things, uh, but I'm happy to come back to that. Uh, in the discussion. Um, I'm focusing very much on the accession uh, of countries to the Eurozone. Uh, and as an opening remark, I want to say there's a big difference between readiness and willingness. Um, and I think uh, we should be focusing on readiness uh, because money does not buy willingness. Um, so those countries which do not want to join are not going to join um, and uh, monetary instruments are not going to help. Um, but readiness matters a lot. Uh, readiness matters uh, for the exceeding countries, and it matters for the EMU as a whole, and I will come back to that. What, I mean, what do I mean by readiness? Um, I think readiness uh, for me is real convergence. Um, do we have real convergence between the countries um, who come into the Eurozone or those who are within the Eurozone? Um, and there, I would say that since the crisis, something has changed. Um, I think there's real doubt whether uh, being inside the Eurozone promotes convergence. Um, I think we're seeing a big divergence in performance um, and a um, persistence in that divergence over time. So I think there's an issue here which needs to be addressed. Um, we have some ex ante conditions, Maastricht conditions, uh, but they have not um, been uh, useful in terms of ensuring that countries inside are convergent or continue to have sustainable macroeconomic policies. Um, and we have some exposed mechanisms, uh, but uh, I would also argue they have uh, not worked um, well or they have proven uh, very costly in social and political <coughs> terms. So uh, we need to make sure that countries uh, who are joining are convergent, but I think it's also very important to emphasize that they, uh, that they remain convergent once they are in sight. Uh, I think one of the issues is the, the question of slippage, what happens after the country joins, after uh, the incentive uh, to reform is gone. Um, I think the EU budget uh, is at least a tricky instrument uh, when we look at convergence. I'm not sure there's a lot of evidence that the EU budget works very well in uh, encouraging structural reform and encouraging um, sustainable macroeconomic policies. Um, yes, uh, it is still early days for a lot of the instruments which are there. Um, but I think uh, we should also not expect too much from the EU budget. Um, in the end, this is about uh, mainly uh, member state action. It's what happens on the ground. Uh, so the EU budget can give some incentives, uh, but in the end, the decisions are <laughs> taken by member state governments. Uh, and uh, we have seen repeatedly over recent years that if governments are unwilling to do certain things, if there's no buy-in, 
then it does not happen. Um, design helps. Uh, if we design it in particular ways, some things have worked better than others. Uh, but in the end, uh, we still have to rely on the member state action. I think going forward, we, do, uh, we could envisage a bigger role for the EU budget. Uh, because we do need to make the Eurozone more crisis resilient, we need to reduce vulnerability to shocks, and uh, we need to ensure also that future crises um, do not um, increase divergence even further. Um, I'm not going to go into the first two instruments um, in terms of a Eurozone budget. I think it is needed because uh, we lose the tool of devaluation once you're inside. Um, I think the second one is uh, what the first panel was really about, uh, long-term economic performance. Uh, but I would say there's also a need to specifically focus something on those countries, the pre um which uh, are aspiring to enter uh, the Eurozone. Uh, and that's in terms of both technical and budget support for specific reforms, for capacity building, um, but also uh, to have a, a funding mechanism uh, to decrease uh, problems uh, with Eurozone accession. Um, I think here we need to have clarity of objectives. It needs to be clear what instruments are needed for what specific purposes. I think too often in the EU, uh, we have too many objectives uh, being attached to single funding instruments, uh, which just makes it impossible to deliver. Um, having a pre-euro support for pre-ends requires a continuous commitment, uh, both of net contributors and net recipients. Uh, and I think it necess necessitates a much greater discussion between all the stakeholders uh, to design it in the right way, because detail matters. Um, uh, if we don't design it in the right way, it is not going to deliver uh, the kind of change which we want to see on the ground. And here are some of the questions I think we need to answer uh, before we can do that. But in all that, uh, we should not forget <laughs> that we are in um, a broader environment which is extremely tricky. There's a constrained funding environment. Uh, we've talked about that at the conference um, for a couple of days. Um, so we need to find a space for this kind of instrument, but I would argue addressing economic and social divergence for pre is critical because the consequence of not addressing it, in my view, is that we would get further crisis uh, within the Eurozone um, and that we would then get the need for painful adjustments in future, and those painful adjustments, um, as we have seen in the past, can um, put the whole economic and monetary union in question. Um, we also have to look uh, further, I think, into the growth enhancing reforms needed um, ex post accession, um, and that includes also the countries already in the Eurozone, but I think that's a, a broader topic which I think we, we can't go into uh, in, in more detail, and my time is almost up. Uh, but as a final point, uh, I just want to say uh, this is, I think, the third or fourth of these big conferences I've been at. Um, and a lot of the discussion reminds me of previous conferences. And the big challenge is always that we can come up with a very rational budget. We can come up with new and effective instruments. But the question is whether there's the political will to actually do that, and particularly in the current environment. Uh, where the constraints are very biting. Um, and I think this might end up with us creating some tokenistic small instruments, as we have done in the past, which have too little money in them, which don't actually function on the ground. Uh, and that then uh, puts the whole added value of EU spending into question in future. So I would say either we do it right or we don't do it at all. Um, and I think uh, the challenge here is not only to member states, um, it's not only to net payers uh, among the member states, but I would say um, it is a challenge also to what I would call the EU budget community, uh, which comes together to discuss at these, uh, at, at these events, because what you always hear is that everything is important and that everything needs to be maintained and that there is good evidence that everything is useful. Um, I would argue that we are in a situation where these constraints will bite, and that means we have to make choices. 
And that may, means making choices not only between member state uh, level and EU level, but also choices between different objectives and choices between different policies. And that's a much more political choice. Um, and I think uh, in the past, uh, it has ended up with the simple solutions, which are basically a hairstyle, uh, a haircut across policies if we need to cut spending. Uh, but I would argue that is probably the most ineffective way of doing it. Thank you. Okay. Okay, thank, thank you very much. I, th I think, uh, without repeating all of them, uh, I think a, a number of very uh, valuable, uh, valuable insights and contributions. Um, personally, I, I, but really personally, so <laughs> not, not even speaking on behalf of the Commission here, uh, I would fully echo your, 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 your last, uh, last point that indeed uh, I think this is the time uh, to, to try to make some, some, some real choices. Uh, with, with the Brexit, uh, as painful as it is, it, it also provides an opportunity to, 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 to really rethink what, what we're doing. And I would also fully subscribe to what you say, well, do it well or don't do it. Uh, but again, this is me speaking, uh, which is maybe not that much interesting. Much more interesting <coughs> is uh, what our next uh, guest, our panelist, is going to say, uh, <coughs> Minister Skilt Kluna from, 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 from Malta. Please, take the floor. I would take uh, up from where Fabian has left uh, regarding the uh, difference between readiness and, and willingness. And... Um, I agree, willingness cannot be bought with money, but willingness depends on the uh, shape of the Eurozone itself, how attractive it is. I mean, once a partner is attractive enough, one might consider marriage, but so um, it's important to look at the Eurozone um, <coughs> and the shape it's in. And However, we're in the ambit of the MFF and the budget. I think one can start the discussion, uh, one cannot start the discussion without addressing the issue of timing. It's not that we should uh, or not be discussing budgetary issues within the MFF, because that's, there's obvious that doing nothing is not an option. And what I mean is whether one should add to the existing budgetary problems, headaches, challenges, uh, with more ambitious challenges where it concerns the euro area itself. Um, after all, one must admit, it's not easy time with various depressing events and developments with genuine people's uh, disappointments reflected in anti-establishment resentment, polarized divisions and certain political uh, regressiveness in certain countries. And though not pleasant to admit, we have certain deadlocks. So I do not consider myself, uh, first of all, uh, I, I don't consider myself in the visionary camp, if you want to call it that. I prefer to stay with, the, with my feet on the ground and, and be in the pragmatic camp. But still, I believe this is the time to debate a new way uh, of doing things, uh, to admit to failures where they occurred, but uh, lay out a way forward. I do not think that in the uh, Council and Eurogroup, to where I belong, anybody is for the status quo. We have to move forward. The distinction between the visionaries and the pragmatists, at least from the eyes of the pragmatists, is that the visionaries sometimes, you'll find it in their plans, uh, include uh, certain recycled ideas where, which had failed in the past, but they con continue persisting uh, in them, just, uh, for example, this fixation on certain taxes, which have, uh, um, you know, have, have not worked, or at least have not been approved by many member states. And they continue flogging um, this horse. Um, they do not want to see uh, the obvious sometimes. In other words, uh, if, any, if the Commission uh, refuses to carry out any impact assessment on certain taxes, it will, it will find out that certain countries are going to lose and others are going to win. And therefore, it is obvious that you will not get unanimous uh, uh, approval. So I think that um, pragmatists want to go forward but they need to see the member states uh, completing successfully the current roadmap before they start another one. I'm referring specifically to the banking union and the capital union, and for some countries to abide by the fiscal rules 
and undertake some of the most basic of structural reforms. Which brings us to the topic of our panel discussion. Yes, uh, using a budget as an instrument to support structural reform is good value for money. Structural reforms remove sacred cows from the middle of the road for growth and development uh, to go ahead. It leads to good fiscal and finance, uh, financial governance. It helps also the country abide by the fiscal rules themselves. It reduces risks, thus enabling other countries to accede to risk-sharing programs. So one cannot solve risk-sharing programs or promote stabilization functions, uh, even though they are very good in themselves, without addressing the moral hazard issue in the face. Taking a gradual approach, step by step, you re reduce the mistrust of uh, economic he uh, healthy countries, strong countries, towards weaker ones. I believe that in several documents and studies on the table, especially Professor uh, Monty's one, uh, there are several good and fresh ideas, and one should uh, seek uh, those projects and pro programs addressing market failure at the EU level. And in so doing, we'll have what we refer to as win-win situations. But we should be prepared for win-lose situations too. And for those instances, let us provide compensation for the, um, by the winners for the losers. Uh, we believe in a rainy day fund under the ages of a revamped ESM called the Uni um, European Monetary Fund would be a good start. And uh, with hindsight, the imbalances, uh, after all, the imbalances which were created between surplus and deficit countries could be at, could have been addressed and could be addressed in the future without uh, necessarily the use of a budget. So in conclusion, I think whether it's a visionary or not, now is the time to give a comprehensive look at the past, warts and all, and lay out a better strategy uh, for the future. Only this way can we encourage uh, non-Eurogroup um, uh, member states come forward and join the group where all should belong. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and can I can I summarize it as as let's let's be ambitious but realistic. Is that the uh, I, I think the the, and the one sentence. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now I would like to turn to Mr. Uh, Marcus Weber. Uh, uh, as I, uh, well, I introduced you when, while you were, were still uh, uh, not <laughs> on your way, indeed. Uh, so, uh, member of the European Parliament, vice, uh, vice chair of, the, of the, uh, if I understand, uh, of the Committee on Economic uh, Monetary Affairs, and uh, representing mm -hmm. the, the, EP, the EPP. Um, please, also, also to you, the kind request <coughs> to try to, to be as concise as possible. Thank you very much, and I hope I am allowed to speak in my mother tongue, yeah, uh, yeah. as I saw German translation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> ja, vielen Dank. Ich gebe Ihnen jetzt auch noch kurz eine Sekunde, um einen Kopfhörer aufzuziehen, aber ich freue mich, dass ich hier, wie der Bundesaußenminister gestern, auch in meiner Muttersprache äh, sprechen kann. Ähm, wenn wir uns mit der Frage beschäftigen, ob wir ein Instrument benötigen, um strukturelle Reformen äh, zu ermöglichen und den Beitritt zum Euro zu ermöglichen, dann muss man sich ja zunächst mal mit der Frage beschäftigen, äh, ob wir nicht bisher schon einen Instrumentenkasten haben, der diese Aufgabe zu erfüllen hatte. Und äh, wir haben eine zweite Frage zu beantworten. Wenn wir das innerhalb des Gemeinschaftsbudgets machen wollen, wie kann sichergestellt werden, dass auch alle Mitglieder der Europäischen Union äh, von einem solchen Topf partizipieren, zu können, äh, partizipieren können, weil wir haben es natürlich, wenn ich mit dem Eurobeitritt beginnen darf, auch nach dem Austritt des Vereinigten Königreichs haben wir immer noch ein Opt-out-Land. Wir haben die Pre-Ins und wir haben die Ins. Wenn ich das also aus dem Gemeinschaftshaushalt machen will, muss ich dafür sorgen, dass alle 27 Mitgliedstaaten entsprechend partizipieren können. Das ist eine spannende Herausforderung der man sich natürlich stellen muss, um mal ein erstes Problem äh, zu beschreiben. Die zweite Frage, äh, die sich mir stellt, ist die Frage, sind die Instrumente, die wir bisher haben für die Pre-Ins und für die Ins, im ausreichenden Maße genutzt worden, um das zu erreichen, was wir miteinander erreichen wollen? 
Für die Pre-Ins äh, haben wir mal in den 80er Jahren den Kohäsionsfonds geschaffen, um wirtschaftliche Unterschiede auszugleichen. Die Frage ist also, hat diese Instrumentenkasten so funktioniert, äh, dass die wirtschaftlichen Disparitäten sich in der Europäischen Union abgebaut haben oder nicht? Und das ist äh, äh, an mancher Stelle eine erfolgreiche Bilanz, das ist an mancher Stelle eine sehr ernüchternde Bilanz. Und von daher äh, muss man sich schon mit der Frage auch beschäftigen, ob dieses Instrument angeschärft werden kann, äh, damit es ähm, auch einen Beitrag dazu leistet, äh, ähm, dauerhaft einen Beitrag dazu zu leisten, von einem Empfängerland zu einem Geberland zu werden. Ich komme selber aus dem Freistaat Bayern. Wir waren äh, lange Zeit Empfängerland im Länderfinanzausgleich, aber wir waren dann so gut, dass wir heute der Hauptzahler sind. Das muss jetzt nicht gleich die Motivation sein, dass jeder Hauptzahler werden will. Aber die Motivation sollte schon sein, dass man irgendwann mal kein Empfängerland mehr ist, weil man die wirtschaftlichen Disparitäten überwunden hat. Und äh, ich denke, das sollte eigentlich im Fokus stehen. Und äh, die dritte Frage, die sich damit aufzwängt, ist, ob das, was wir innerhalb der Eurozone, also mit den INS machen, ich verweise zum Beispiel an das europäische Semester, an den Semesterprozess, ob das ausreicht, wirklich den notwendigen politischen Druck auszuüben, dass entsprechende Reformen stattfinden. Ich kann da auch nur für mein eigenes Land sprechen. Da wird immer festgestellt, es ist interessant, was die Kommission vorschlägt. Das ist alles natürlich außerhalb der Kompetenz der Europäischen Union und in der Kompetenz des Nationalstaats. Aber die anderen Staaten, die sollten sich alle daran halten, was im Semester gesagt wurde. Weil ich aber weiß, als Europaabgeordneter, dass das nicht nur in meinem Land so diskutiert wird, sondern in allen 28. Also jeder sieht, was die anderen zu tun haben und sagt, ich selber muss aber nichts tun kommen wir da nicht weiter. Also ist doch die Frage, ob wir die bestehenden Instrumente, wie zum Beispiel den Semesterprozess, konzentrieren können auf ein paar wenige Schlüsselempfehlungen, wo aber dann auch wirklich politischer Druck ausgeübt wird, dass die umgesetzt werden. Und dann kommt die nächste Frage, die wir zu beantworten haben. Ist es nur die Fiskalpolitik, die Antworten geben muss, um asymmetrische Schocks kompensieren zu können? Oder gibt es da auch nicht andere Instrumente? Und das sage ich schon, wenn ich mir anschaue, was wir in den letzten Jahren auch an Regulatorik auf europäischer Ebene beschlossen haben. Als stellvertretender Ausschussvorsitzender im Wirtschafts- und Währungsausschuss habe ich da auch einen gewissen Überblick. Dann haben wir natürlich nicht unbedingt einen Beitrag dazu geleistet, dass Marktlösungen mehr in den Mittelpunkt stehen und konzentrieren uns deswegen in der Diskussion, leider sehr eng nur um fiskalische Lösungen. Und deswegen sollte man hier auch in einem vernünftigen Instrumentenmix darüber nachdenken, wie hier auch im Rahmen der Absorptionsfähigkeit der Märkte durch Regulatorik Voraussetzungen geschaffen werden können. Ich will da nur mal auf die Abhängigkeit zwischen Bankenstabilität und Staatsfinanzierung in einer Reihe von, in einer Reihe von Mitgliedstaaten hinweisen. Solange wir diese Abhängigkeiten haben, ist es sehr schwer, ähm, entsprechende Maßnahmen äh, auch durchzuführen, äh, wenn hier von Seiten der Märkte das Risiko breiter getragen werden könnte, bis zu einem bestimmten Maß, dann ist es auch leichter vorstellbar, im fiskalischen Bereich äh, Dinge zu tun. Aber es nur auf die Fiskalseite zu verlagern, äh, halte ich auch für einen Fehler. Also die Märkte komplett rauszunehmen, ist auch falsch. So, und da einen vernünftigen Mix zu finden, das ist eigentlich... Äh, für mich die Kernproblematik, um die es geht für die Zukunft. Und wenn ich das ganz offen sagen darf, für mein Mitgliedsland, für meine politische Richtung, ist natürlich das, was wir in der Vergangenheit gemacht haben, Reformen gegen Auflagen, als letztes Instrument schon das Erfolgsversprechendste um das in aller Deutlichkeit auch anzusprechen. Das heißt, unkonditioniert halte ich für, für völlig ausgeschlossen, konditioniert nur als letzte Möglichkeit und nicht als den Normalfall. Ansonsten begeben wir uns in eine Schieflage, die auch mit den 1,1 Prozent plus X, die der Haushaltskommissar gestern vorgeschlagen hat, ja nicht bewältigen können. Weil wenn Sie sich das vorstellen, also ich, Durchschnitt in der Europäischen Union 
haben wir in den öffentlichen Haushalten ungefähr 30 Prozent des BIPs, in den sozialen Sicherungssystemen zwischen 15 und 20 Prozent des BIPs. Also der öffentliche Sektor, wenn ich die sozialen Sicherungssysteme mitnehme, macht ungefähr 50 Prozent des BIPs aus. Das ist der EU-Durchschnitt. Wir haben manche drunter, manche drüber. Und wir wussten damit 1,1 Prozent rum, dann werden wir da nicht in der Lage sein, seriös, auch glaubwürdig gegenüber den Märkten, Instrumente entwickeln können, die hier ähm, auch Stabilität generieren können. Und wenn wir das schon so nicht schaffen, dann sollten wir es auch gar nicht tun, weil wir uns nur selber belügen und weil wir äh, damit einen, einen Rahmen äh, schaffen, der im Falle des Falles nicht ausreichend sein kann und sein wird, jemals äh, entsprechende Schocks auch abfedern zu können. Deswegen ist wirklich meine Empfehlung zu einem vernünftigen Verschärfen der bestehenden Instrumente kommen, dass sie zielorientierter funktionieren und zum Zweiten dafür zu sorgen, dass wir ein vernünftiges äh, Risikotragfähigkeitskonzept zwischen Marktinstrumenten und fiskalischen Instrumenten schaffen. Ansonsten werden wir nicht in der Lage sein, diese Herausforderungen zu meistern. Dankeschön. Okay. Ähm, vielen Dank. Ähm You put, uh, I think, on the, t on the table a, a, a couple of important questions, uh, which I'm not going to try to answer here. Maybe, maybe that others would want to, 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 uh, want to have a go at it. Uh, I think clearly one, 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 uh, one point that you, you put very clearly on, on, on the table is that, that there should be a balance. Uh, on the one hand between uh, market, market instruments or market uh, di discipline probably also and, 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 and uh, fiscal, uh, fiscal uh, instruments. Um, with that, I, I would like to, to turn uh, to a colleague, uh, Emmy, uh, member of, of parliament. First of all, I would like to to apologize, I think, uh, Mrs. Beres, that you had some problems with, the <laughs> with, uh, with security. Uh, very happy that you could, uh, could join us, uh, nevertheless. And uh, I, you were not there when, when, uh, when I uh, introduced you. Um, but as I said also to the, to the other uh, members in the panel, I, I would ask you to, to be as, as concise as, as possible so, so that we can also have uh, time for, for discussion uh, after, afterwards. But with, the, with that, and, uh, I, I would like to give you uh, the floor for your, your intervention. Thank you so much. Uh, sorry that I thought that in the 21st century you can live without a, a, an ID card. Um, and sorry also for all the other panelists where I only heard uh, part of the last uh, expose. Uh, thank you for having uh, members uh, mainly involved in the, the EMU, uh, also uh, in this uh, two days very high level conference. Um, my, my, my expose will, will mainly focus uh, where we stand, which means with the package that was uh, presented uh, lately by the Commission uh, on the next step for, for the EMU, because this is where it uh, does uh, interlink with the whole discussion on the, uh, the next uh, um, MMF. Um, MFF. Um, and here, uh, maybe we can go more in, into the detail uh, uh, in the discussion. But uh, I would like um, uh, to have one general remark. Uh, and once more, uh, I believe also it's why I've been invited to this uh, uh, panel, that uh, uh, my angle and my uh, point of view is related with the functioning of the Eurozone. And it's also related to this that I want to address the two topics that are here on the table, the support for structural reform and the question of the euro area accession. And my introductory remark would be that for me, uh, it is absolutely necessary, uh, also in the context of the Brexit, uh, to enlarge the Eurozone as much and as quickly as possible. No doubt about this. But this doesn't mean that you have to wait until the Eurozone completely 
uh, overlap the EU as such uh, before you should do uh, what needs to be done. Because otherwise, uh, there will be nothing to be done because the euro will not exist anymore. So this is really, for me, the starting point. And here, somehow, uh, in the uh, State of the Union speech by President Juncker, this year I had a slight disappointment here, when there was, between the line, the idea that maybe we should wait that everybody is in before we could go on. Uh, if we do this, we will not go on anymore in the future. So no doubt that my purpose is that everybody should join. And exactly in this line, I would be blunt as to say that if UK is going to do a U-turn and wants to remain, they should be in discussion uh, for them to join the euro. Not to put it, to, to make it more difficult, but to make it sustainable. This is not the topic for today. When it comes to the topic for today, uh, I have two strong messages. Uh, the first one is related to the question of the structural reform. What has been proposed by the Commission um, in this uh, EMU package uh, addresses some aspect of it, which I think is very, very important, which is the support for administrative capacity. For very long, it's been a taboo, uh, because um, also in the Council, for long, people were saying, well, if you have help for administrative capacity, it is money for corruption. Uh, well, we've been uh, learning by doing that uh, if you want to avoid corruption, you also need to make sure you have good administrative capacity. So you cannot avoid the debate. And it's better to use the EU money also to help this upgrade of administrative capacity. So no doubt, this is a very critical a point and a very substantive structural reform. The question is how to do it. And here, between the line and on top of what's written in the document by the Commission, I would say there is a principal discussion that is very critical. How to obtain and to make sure member states fulfill their task in terms of structural reform. Of course, there's one debate, what is the structural reform you want to follow? This is a principal debate. But then how to implement it? how to best to implement it. To have sanction, penalties, overview by someone in Brussels, or to have an ownership uh, at home. You can say both, okay, but once you do this, you don't go on very far. And somehow, I would say, in the parliament, I have initiated with others a debate about this idea of a code of convergence. And I really regret that it's not in the document at all presented by the Commission in its package. What is the idea between the code of convergence? The only word about convergence that is mentioned in the EU package by the uh, Commission lately is about convergence with the non-Eurozone member state, which is not absolutely not the, one, the convergence we are addressing. We are addressing convergence inside the Eurozone, and we know how critical this point is. How to achieve this? Uh, the starting point for this idea that was uh, also elaborated by the Sherpa in the previous uh, mandate by the Parliament is that to build on the added value of the Maastricht criteria. When you had the Maastricht criteria to join the euro, you had a utmost ownership by member state to do the structural reform. And this has been the most successful structural reform ever realized in the EU. And so if you want to build on this, the idea of a code of convergence where a member state would need to fulfill two or three uh, driving uh, 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 reform, uh, for us, uh, sounds like something that should be much more explored. On the other hand, uh, you can see that in the Commission's paper, um, there's a temptation to go back to this idea of the contract. And uh, here I have a principal uh, point of debate. I know my time is already over, so I just want to say one word about uh, accession, accessing to the, to the euro, because it's also uh, uh, a point for discussion. And here, uh, we should not be uh, uh, um, uh, uh, naive. What is on the table on the proposal by the Commission is a very, very small 
uh, opening of the box. Huh? It's not. And I've, I've heard from non-Eurozone member states a temptation to uh, applaud to this proposal like if it would be uh, a possibility to access more support uh, or more help from the EU. Uh, first of all, uh, up to now, the envelope that will be for this is a tiny one, a tiny one. Huh? But of course, uh, what we have to look at, does this mean uh, the new uh, uh, multi-annual financial framework will be redesigned uh, completely to shovel the current uh, structural fund to these kind of funds, which m would be much more uh, under condition. Fair enough, this is the time to open the discussion. But if we do so, uh, for me, it needs also to be uh, linked to an engagement of the member state to concretely join the euro uh, and to a calendar, which is not up to now uh, discussed. Not to say that I want to harsh, because I know how much all what you do before accessing the euro is critical. But then you need to be a time frame. Okay. Well, th thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, and again, uh, apologies for 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 the for the hiccup <laughs> that that you had uh, in, when 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 coming uh, when coming here. Um, Again, uh, I, I, I think there is. Uh, I think an interesting debate is is, is shaping is shaping up, um, and I, I think what I what I take from from you uh, very clear is that look, it is essential to to uh, to, to, to to expand uh, the eurozone. But at the same time, if I if I listen well, and please correct me if I'm, I, I say this, uh, I've misinterpreted uh, this. Uh, you say, look, but convergence is not something that that stops uh, when you're in, uh, in in the eurozone, and then and 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 then it really comes to to a question on, on how best to uh, to to promote that. Um, in the interest of time, I I, I want to go to uh, the next uh, next speaker on the list, but, but I can well imagine that later on uh, also maybe panelists want to comment uh, to, to one, one another if we still have time. Um, so the next uh, panelist is uh, Mr. Eliodor Manders, the State Secretary for Public uh, Finance. Uh, please, uh, interested in your perspective. <clears throat> Thank you very much for the invitation. I am uh, honored to take part uh, in the event organized today. Um, uh, it's uh, an important uh, year for us uh, that uh, Romanians uh, celebrate uh, 100 years uh, since the great union, uh, the fulfillment of our national uh, unity. Uh, you can, uh, we can say uh, today uh, we are a proud uh, member of uh, European family and uh, Romania speaks and th thinks uh, as a European nation uh, that uh, appreciates uh, the virtues of uh, this project of uh, peace and uh, prosperity. Uh, this, the optimi optimistic economic sentiment related to the favorable uh, economic context must be doubled by an EU and EMU reform. That is uh, why Romania is joining the, the efforts uh, that are being made uh, to strengthen our common uh, home, the European Union. Speaking about uh, the position of Romania on the future finances of uh, EU, uh, as regards the calendar of negotiations uh, on the future uh, multiannual financial framework, Romania supports the Commission objective to try to obtain an agreement on the amounts uh, post-2020 during the Romanian presidency. The future budget should ensure a fair approach balancing the new priorities uh, with the European traditional policies, which have already contributed to economic growth and creation of jobs in the EU. Uh, we consider that the EU budget must continue to generate important resources to achieve the real convergence of the member states' economies, in particular through cohesion policy and the common uh, agricultural policy. 
those policies are in line with the, the concept of European added value in connection with the, the added value for citizens. Referring to Romania on the road to convergence and joining the Eurozone, I would like to reaffirm our goal to join the Eurozone as a, a goal which has been assumed by the entire political and uh, class and uh, uh, entire society. I have to mention that more than 60% of uh, Romanians are supporting uh, the accession to Eurozone. Uh, this commitment uh, requires uh, the achievement of costly structural reform, reforms and part of the cost of such reforms uh, may be covered from the EU budget. Joining the Eurozone is not an option, of course, uh, but uh, an obligation arising from uh, our uh, EU membership. The decision uh, and time for joining the Eurozone depends on the state uh, of the economy. Uh, I would like to mention uh, that uh, in December 2016, uh, at the Prime Minister's Cabinet uh, level, we set up an uh, interministerial committee for the adoption uh, of the Euro. Uh, you may see on the slides uh, the membership. membership uh, uh, one of the goals of this committee is to set up a timeline to join the Eurozone so that uh, starting this year we may make significant uh, steps uh, in this direction. Uh, let's have a look now uh, to the Maastricht criteria. Romania is currently fulfilling uh, the nominal criteria for convergence uh, and uh, we are uh, within the limits for uh, all the indicators. Uh, indicators uh, uh, but the problem is uh, with the real convergence. And uh, speaking about uh, it, uh, since our accession in 2007, we have uh, made uh, important steps uh, looking, at, looking at the indicator GDP per capita. Uh, uh, we can figure out that it's uh, below EU, EU average, uh, now uh, is 58% of the EU average, <coughs> and also we can observe a growth uh, above the average, we are uh, in top uh, three country. Uh, despite uh, Romania's convergence uh, with the EU member states, uh, and despite we had an outstanding uh, GDP growth uh, of 7% uh, last year and uh, a for, a forecast for 5.5% for this year, um, the Romanian regions are divergent and being uh, and are among the least uh, de developed uh, in the EU regions. The issue of regional divergence is also influenced by the major um, gaps between countryside and the cities which still exist in Romania. Uh, the social indicators are also significant for real convergence. Romania registers the highest poverty rate among the EU employees and the percentage of people working in agriculture out of the total employees is the highest in the entire EU. So we are uh, low performance as well in uh, inequality, school abandon or uh, entrepreneurial initiative. So we have to, a lot of work to do uh, to get the real convergence and uh, that implies significant amount of resources. You may see on the slides uh, some da data about convergence across the member states. Um, let's go now straight to the proposed instrument. Romania supports the introduction of a tool for joining the Eurozone to the, but uh, also we consider it to be complementary to the traditional tools of uh, MFF uh, oriented towards supporting convergence and cohesion within the EU. We consider that uh, support uh, instrument for structural reforms is appropriate and could be targeted towards the member states with a high convergent gap, convergence gap. Um, another proposal may be that uh, financing should be focused on structural reforms in priority areas, such as business environment, administration, <coughs> education, healthcare, and transport infrastructure. Uh, it is essential uh, that proposal for structural reforms to be homegrown. Um, the Commission proposed in the, the introduction of this instrument in two stages. For the first stage, uh, during the current uh, MFF, 
we only see a very limited amount of resources possible to be redeployed. To the second stage, uh, it, it is to be developed during the next MFF. Uh, this instrument should be considered as a new priority, and therefore it should be fin financed apart uh, from structural funds under the principle more for more by going beyond the 1% the one the one ceiling of the EU GNI. Uh, I have to mention that as the member states are uh, required to make uh, strong commitment for reform and for euro area accession, this should be reflected in a stronger association of non-euro area member states to euro area decision making. We are confident that non-euro member states can bring uh, an important input to the discussions. Uh, we also consider the uh, current Eurogroup's process uh, identi identification or benchmarking of good practices regarding structural reforms uh, should be a source of uh, inspiration for, for uh, non-euro countries, and the uh, EU Commission can be a facilitator. Uh, as a conclusion, Romania's place uh, is uh, in the Eurozone, and the re reduction of convergence gaps and making the economy flexible is the vehicle to take us there. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you very much. That, that was a very clear message uh, at the end, an, um, uh, an ambitious uh, message. Uh, in the interest of, uh, of time, I, I would like to move straight away to uh, the, the last uh, speaker on the panel, uh, Mr. Risto Achoki, Secretary of State for Finance in Finland. Thank you, and thank you for the invitation to this panel. I try to be brief in order to shape our future reforms are needed. We have to reform the EU budget. We have to find, find uh, let's say, new, new ways to at, at address the new priorities and political challenges like immigration, security, and so on. And then, of course, which is even more important, we have to do our homework reforms at natu national level and therefore we have, must have a look what can be done to help member states to do the necessary reforms, which are never, never easy. Which is fact is that in the future there will be constant need of ongoing reforms in all member states because the artificial in intelligence, digitalization, aging and climate change are changing the environment around us so rapidly that in order to be competitive, competitive and survive, the Europe has to be on ongoing reform process all the time. Now, then, before uh, looking at the new instruments in helping member states to do the reforms, we have to look how the current ones are functioning and whether they are used efficiently, as Mr. Ferber already, already mentioned. And then, for example, structural funds, whether they could be used to help help reforms in member states more efficiently that, than currently, and on the other way around, whether member states should do more effectively reforms to make the use of the structural funds more, more effective and, 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 and successful. Then, secondly, this technical aid, the structural reform support program, we feel that it's actually a relatively good example of result-oriented use of EU money, and, and we feel it's delivering whether the budget has to be doubled has to be discussed further, but, but it seems to be functioning and there seems to be need for that kind of measures, technical assistance for member states, which is good. Then looking at, at, at all these new ideas, like, like some funding for the euro area within the FFF to help help or support economic reforms and boost competitiveness, we have some openness in our thinking for those, those topics, but they have to be well controlled, limited, and of course the overall envelope of the MFF should not be increased. And, and what I said, whatever the system is, it should be efficient, legitimate and transparent, and, and sound management of the EU funds must be guaranteed. 
But as said, we are uh, at the starting point is that we are somehow skeptical for creating totally new instruments, for example, to support euro area accession. As we have the structural funds, other instruments, we should make best use out of those ones before creating the new instruments. It's, in the EU politis, policy, it's quite e often <coughs> habit to have new instruments without abolishing the old ones. And perhaps the agricultural policy is the best example of, of that. So before looking at the old new instruments, we should have a serious look at the old ones and how, how they are used. Then whether EU money should be used to, let's say, intensify member states to make reforms, we have some doubts on that one because most of the structural reforms are quite national and they need, there is a need for national ownership. And if there isn't national ownership, they, don't, they won't be realized. And having a kind of a European dimension in that discuss, discussion might be, might be actually counterproductive, as already said by, by, by some of the speakers yesterday. And, and there are examples of several member states where there's been a long delay of structural reforms, but once there has been a new head of state, so things have started to happen a bit more rapidly, and that's what is actually needed, member states who commit to the idea of the euro area and to the structural reforms which are needed. And about this inter rewarding for the reforms, it's, it's the worst outcome would be that that actually the member states would start thinking that in order to make reforms, you have to be paid for. Now, the reforms are in the interest of all member states, and they should be done, let's say, on their own basis, on voluntary basis, because it's good for the member state concerned, it's good for their citizens, and secondly, it's, of course, good for the euro area and for the Europe as whole. Well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you to, to, to actually to all speakers for, for, for being uh, concise. And, and, and that means that we still have uh, 50, uh, 50 minutes for, for questions. Um, I think uh, the last intervention was, was I think, uh, very clear. Yes, the uh, need for, for structural reforms. Uh, relatively positive, I think, on, on uh, providing from the EU budget uh, technical support for, uh, for that. Uh, not a total closeness on, on other initiatives, but, but more, more questions, I think. That, that is the, I, I would say, the, 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 the ultra-short summary uh, of, of, of what you were saying. Now, uh, with that, uh, I, I would like to, uh, to open uh, the floor uh, to, uh, for Questions, comments in, in in the audience. Yes, please. It's always difficult to be the first, but I'll try to be the first in that debate. I am the Secretary General of the Conference of Peripheral Maritime Regions, CERPE. Zonka, I know uh, some, at least of the MEPs, we've been speaking in the past uh, together. Um, one issue that I wanted to discuss, I mean, there is a, a lot of uh, agreement in actually needing uh, the structural reforms to happen. There is a general disagreement, or at least <laughs> divergence of proposals as to how this will happen. Uh, will it happen with national funds? Will it happen with European funds, uh, etc.? Will it happen with maybe own resources? Nobody spoke about that, but there is a discussion about the euro budget and own resources, etc. My concern, coming from the regional perspective, just to add on on all this uh, <laughs> convergence or misconvergence, is to speak about this pilot project that Romania colleagues spoke before about. The pilot project that's going to be used for actually doing structural reforms from uh, unspent, from the performance uh, reserve, sorry, and the technical assistance of the structural funds. Uh, so this will be used as a pilot action, and then uh, it will be introduced within the future MFF. My question is, how is it possible that we see the results of a pilot project being happening now and then being introduced in the MFF, which is going to happen in May. So we won't have any idea of how this pilot action resulted in anything good or not good to be sure that it's going to be a part of the next MFF. I find it a little bit uh, dairy. So sorry to add into the complexity of the question. 
Okay. Uh, any is there any one of the panel members that want to 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 react to 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 this one, to this? Uh, yeah? Uh, I, I believe it's more a question for the commission now, uh, yeah. but uh, no, ju just two, two observations. Uh, the first one is, uh, I think you, you have a very, very fair point. Huh? We know normally a pilot project, it takes two years to have it in place, and then we have uh, one more year to find out and blah, blah, blah. So uh, it's too late to have it as a proper pilot project. So maybe we should uh, propose that it's not a pilot project, but it's a... It's a, 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 a trial period huh? or a training period for what's going to happen in the next MFF. And this is for me something that is really very challenging that I think people have not so much uh, looked at. That in the EMU package, the most consistent proposal is the one on the budget. It is the one that has the most T's in it. And that really looks like a predefinition of what's going to be the next MFF discussion. And this is why I was mentioning the fact that uh, uh, non-Eurozone member state, and you clearly answered to it, you want it as a, an add-on. But uh, uh, I warn you, I'm not so sure it's going to be as an add-on also, because if you speak about a pilot project, it's because you want to use it to reshape the rest of the package. And, but the, and, I, and then I was uh, also astonished that you didn't raise the point that uh, we have a, a question of articulation of power because uh, up to now, the main uh, budget uh, uh, envelopes, they are dealt with at the regional level and this does interfere with political decision on structural reform that are decided at the member state level. And so how do you articulate this debate in the triangle between the commission, uh, the member state and the region is going to be something that I, I believe is not going to be solved with the pilot project. <laughs> Just one point to add um, to the complexity. Um, I think even when we do evaluations um, of spending, what we tend to focus on is to evaluate within the policy areas. And I think what we actually need to look at when we are in such a constrained funding environment is between policy areas. So it's much more about determining whether this is not only a good use of money, but whether it's the best use of money, which is far more complex. And I think uh, that is going to be virtually impossible to do if we're talking about proposals in May. Okay, May maybe just, uh, I, even though I had, had uh, when coming to, to, to this meeting, I, I thought I'm going to listen uh, most of all. And, and, Rather than to to respond, no, I, I. But but let me say one 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 thing on on, on this uh, on this one. Uh, no, I think I think you are absolutely correct that a formal evaluation is is, is not possible. But I would like to take uh, an example of of an initiative that I've been involved in uh, before, and that was the the SME initiative, which was highly highly complex to to uh, to get it done. And uh, and and that this uh, there was an, an idea, but but this could only be developed actually in in, in, in trying it out. And uh, if I remember correctly, the first uh, the first one uh, I think was actually uh, Spain and Malta, if I, if I if I remember correct. And that was also just to work through the complexity of things. And I think that, that is something that, uh, that, that could be the value of, of starting. Now, it could also test whether, whether there is demand for such, uh, for such a thing, uh, uh, to what extent. So I think one, but, but I take your point in terms of a for, formal evaluation, uh, that yeah. will simply not be, be possible. That, 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 that's, that's very Sorry. clear. Yes. Um, so I tried in Bavarian English. Uh, I think we have to see two different things. Uh, firstly, um, a lot of these reforms are not a question of money. It's a question of political will, and sometimes even of political survival. Uh, <laughs> but not a question of money. And seriously, uh, we, we, we should not mix things uh, which are not linked together. Uh, but uh, uh, to answer your question very shortly, you are absolutely right. We will have no uh, assessment about the success of this uh, new trial uh, before 
we have to agree on the MFF and all the legislative issues around the MFF, which is not only a money issue, it's a lot of legislation as well. Um, I, I tend to agree um, with that. On the other hand, um, the, in the Council, these the ministers, we have the uh, Stability and Growth Pact, but we don't have guidance. I mean, the, the country-specific recommendations are there. Every year they come up. Next year they'll come up just in a different way. But um, I, in, the, in this way, that's why I like um, uh, Provence's uh, suggestion of a sort of a code of convergence. At least there should be some lines, uh, uh, some lines of convergence, even within the Eurogroup, whereby um, they would be elaborate. Just reaching um, a surplus or a balance in your finance and the debt is falling, that's fine. But, you know, um, I think this enhanced uh, criteria under the Code of Arms would, would make some sense, where at least the uh, country-specific recommendations would have that objective. And at least there would be some 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 target where where you're approaching, but I tend to agree. I mean, it's not just a question of money. In fact, I I was quite pleasantly surprised that there's a, a lot of consensus here that mm -hmm. we have to be ambitious. But it doesn't mean that you just go and, and start dreaming of big monies and big budgets and uh, you know uh, stabilization. It's <laughs> fine, but but it's not uh, doable at this point. I think we we have time for for maybe one one more question. Uh, please, yes. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Martin Klaus Sorensen. Now at the Danish uh, Perma Rep, uh, but I used to be a director general in the Commission. I'm uh, happily married uh, to a Greek woman, and I still remember travelling down to Greece the first time on a dark road financed by the European uh, Community Funds. Uh, at 10 o'clock at night, speeding up, <coughs> going to Athens, and suddenly there was no bridge. <laughs> there was no bridge, because the administrative capacity had meant that the public procurement procedures had been stalled for two and a half years. Now, this little anecdote, just to say that later, of course, I discovered, as you know well, Martin, that the whole Greece was one big road without bridges and with a very weak administrative capacity. And I must say, um, I have a big concern because I'm a profound believer in the euro. It's a commonality, it's a communion of destiny. If we do not manage to develop an administrative culture where we can trust each other and where people have the competences, it's not only political will, it's competences where they actually know how to control a budget, where they know how to evaluate, where when their minister comes with a strange idea, with all due respect for ministers, but they do have strange ideas, the administrative structure is resilient enough to say, sorry, my friend, it doesn't work like that. You have to go back and we will have to do it differently. And that's what I would like to see coming out of the instrument for structural adjustment. Because basically we know how to make structural adjustment, but this administrative capacity. What it costs to buy uh, 10 kilometers of motorway, you can get an entirely new Ministry of Finance. And I think in some of our member states, that's what we need. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Much and, and, and well, very, very nice to, 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 to see, you, see you again. And I think this is actually a very, very good note. Uh, on which to to, to end uh, this uh, this discussion, um, I, I I want to to, to, to just try to draw we some. Have to protect Greece before. Mm -hmm. I could oh, okay, you. First of all, we have of course uh, to pre protect Greece. It's not a Greek issue. Uh, so your example, I can tell you a story from my even my constituency in the same way. Yep. So that is not. And honestly, if we start like that, uh, then we should uh, think on uh, who is joining European Union has to show that its administration is able to bear all the obligations uh, from the European Union. Sorry, all of them, 27 are in, though they have to bear and they are able to bear it, otherwise they wouldn't be in the European Union. I think that is not the question uh, we have to focus on uh, because then we are really in a in, in a mess, in a trouble, where, where we can do uh, anything or nothing. 
Firstly, Denmark is always invited to join the euro. <laughs> so st st start, start at home. And uh, secondly, um, uh, 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 the question of, of these, uh, I, I raised the issue of the cohesion fund and structural uh, funds, whether they are really bringing this kind of uh, economical um, cohesion, which uh, they have been foreseen for. Uh, that is something we should uh, put into question in any member state uh, or as <coughs> European Union as a whole, but not on, on one example. Yeah. Okay. I, I, uh, I want to avoid that we uh, are going to uh, reopen a discussion which I, I, I tried to, to close. I I, 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 Greece, so I uh, have to do it. No, no, I, I, well, I love Greece also a lot. I spend actually a lot of time uh, of myself in, uh, in Greece. Uh, and I think it, it is a fair point that this is not uh, about uh, Greece. And I don't, I, I was not how I uh, understood the, uh, the, the comment. It is, uh, and I think uh, there I, I would agree with, with Klaus, he is pointing out the, the importance of, of uh, administrative capacity at the level of the member state also for the functioning as the EU as a whole. I think that, that is the point that, that uh, was made and this goes well beyond, uh, well beyond Greece. So on that note, I, I, I do want to, to start uh, to, to, uh, to close. If I read the discussion, uh, I, 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 I do see quite a, quite a bit, bit of convergence, actually, uh, on, uh, in, in views. One, uh, I think I've heard no one saying, I've heard no one saying uh, that real convergence is not important. I think everybody agrees on, on, on the importance of, of, of real convergence and also on the, on the need, at least, I, uh, but please correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that everybody agrees on the need for structural reforms and, in particular, I would almost say uh, the need to, to, to invest in administrative, in administrative capacity. Uh, uh, then um, my sense from the discussion is that uh, probably of all the proposals that were, that were put on the table, I think the, the, the proposal for, uh, on, on, on providing technical support uh, is, 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 seems to be the least, uh, the least uh, controversial. Uh, I think I heard a number of, of people saying that uh, this is actually good, good value uh, for money. Beyond, uh, beyond that, uh, there are clearly discussions uh, to, to, to be had. Uh, the, uh, and, and, and here we, we have heard some, some, some different views, important questions were raised on, on is the semester doing what it, uh, what it uh, should do? Uh, the, the idea of, of the, the convergence code was, uh, was, was mentioned, uh, I think. Uh, and, uh, well, questions were, were raised about uh, how, how, whether money would, would buy reforms. Let me put it, uh, let me put it like, like, like that. So, so these are, I think, all important uh, questions we should further reflect on. So with that, I, I would like to thank, first, first of all, the, the panel. Uh, for their very uh, good contributions, and I would also like to thank the audience. And, um, and on this note, I close. Thank you. And a big hand for, for the.